And uh, if you all notice, I'm in an elementary school right now. We just did school visits all day long uh, at, in El Segundo in Compton, all in Southern California with the League of Innovative Schools. So it was great to be here all day. I'm so energized after seeing such really powerful learning. And I kept thinking about you all all day and what I wanted to share um, as I was visiting all of these um, all of these classrooms. So it was really fun to see your comments throughout the week and some of the things that resonated last week. Uh, and we're going to dive into the the powerful learning experiences this week. So um, part two, um, part two is really about, I was looking at Ben's learning about neurosequential model in education. Wow. I love it. <laughs> um, we're going to focus today on how we can create the most impactful learning experiences. And we know that starts with the science of learning and how we, how we really, how our bodies and minds, um, really interact when we engage in powerful learning and how we can design those, um, in our classrooms, how we can think about more um, competency-based, purposeful, authentic, and empowering learning experiences. And what I want to just start off with here today is this idea that in each of these chapters, again, I start off with um, the learning experiences and the, and the learning sciences, but intentionally, I really separated and tried to really get clear on competency-based, personalized learning, authentic, empowering learning. A lot of times I see it's one or the other. Um, and what I mean by that, there's different frameworks that are personalized and competency-based and the authenticity is missing. Or sometimes there's great projects. They're really authentic and based in the real world, but the the deep skill building is missing. And so when we think about these really rich, authentic um, learner-centered experiences, they include both of them and often leverage technology in the most powerful ways to not replace the teacher, not just to drill and kill, but to allow students to navigate their path. Um, and it was so fun to see so much of that today in some of these schools. So as we, as we dive in, um, I, I have this model that is in the book that is really the school-centered idea. And if you see these images, it's really about um, if you think about a traditional school centered paradigm, which we're constantly trying to fight, right? That's what our structures are set up for. Policies, schedule, curriculum are all doled out to the teacher. And the teacher then is supposed to address 30 kids in the classroom or, you know, multiple classrooms and figure out how to test and rank and sort and figure out where those kids are. That is how we've been, many of us have gone to school. That's how we've been taught to teach. And so shifting to this paradigm, of course, is not as easy as just like, oh, we'll just change it in a, in a second. It takes really intentional thinking about how to redesign systems. And again, building from those whole child outcomes, if we are just building from standardized um, standards and a standardized system, we're missing the bigger picture. And so these whole child outcomes, of course, take into account that we want to have people with deep skills, reading, writing, mathematician, you know, math skills, we need all those deep skills, but we also need to know that they're, they're applicable to things beyond that and the skills that we need to be successful um, in life. And so if we start from whole child outcomes, then we can think about who are the learners? Who are the, who are the young people in our classrooms and our communities that we're really thinking about uh, and look at that community and then we understand, of course, there are so many different ways to learn. There are personalized pathways, experts and mentors, hands-on experiments, which again, I saw tons of videos, peer collaboration, inquiry projects. It is not always that it has to come from the teacher. The teacher doesn't always have to be the one sharing the information, guiding the instruction, giving the lecture, but they can be there facilitating, supporting, um, and, and really pushing students so that you focus on the demonstration of learning and that mastery um, of those outcomes. So that's kind of the focus today. And I um, love to share different examples uh, of what's happening all across our schools. And so one of my favorite, this is the one I started the um, chapter six with, or I'm sorry, chapter five, uh, the the, to focus on the uh, science of learning. And Salad Wars 
although this happened in Encinitas, California, it's an, it's an example of an authentic project that could happen in any community when you think about the resources, the context, but the power of this project was that it really was able to bring in students' interests, collaboration. They had to make something. They had to get authentic feedback. They were learning about water. They were learning about healthy nutrition. They were cooking and creating something, which so many of our students talk about loving to do. They want to learn how to cook. They want to learn about you know, financial literacy. They want to learn about these real world skills that they know are going to help them be successful in life. And so when you think about these projects, being able to read, write, communicate, design something, these critical skills were put together in this project where students had to create that salad dressing. So thinking about, I want you to think for a minute about some of your favorite learning experiences. Ben put his in um, and I want to um, be able to think about, okay, if we know the brain science and we know the science of learning, how do we actually think about the work that we're doing and make sure it's connecting. So um, examples of communicating high expectations and keeping learners at the edge of mastery. Um, students learn when they feel connected. Um, thinking about the environment, right? Being able to work outside, inside, having the space that's conducive to learning, so powerful. Um, learning is a process that involves effort, mistake, reflection, and refinement of strategies. And so some of these key principles so often are present in our classrooms that are have really powerful learning. And when we don't have these principles, we start to wonder, okay, where, where are we missing some of these things? Am I not giving feedback? Am I not allowing for students to practice and demonstrate? Are they not having opportunities to collaborate with one another? So as you think about what works and what doesn't, really anchoring on the science of learning, rather than this is the way we've always done it, right? You know, we've heard it, we've, we've sometimes said it, we, um, we are always faced with that. But when you think, this is just the way I teach my kids. So a teacher told me recently, well, I can't give feedback. I have 150 kids. There's no way I can give feedback. So that is one way of thinking about it. But if we don't give feedback, and we don't design learning experiences that don't engage learners in the way the process of learning, we are simply just assigning tasks and grading them and moving on. And that's, um, you know, unfortunately, not necessarily teaching, it is it is assigning, um, assigning work. So the first section that or the, this um, chapter six is about um, competency based learning, and really this big shift of allowing learners to move at their own pace and place and follow the path that allows them to demonstrate a mastery of knowledge, skills and dispositions. I truly believe this is one of the core um, levers that's going to shift the system when we really start shifting our assessment system and what we measure, we can really start to create more space for that learning it's it's a really powerful and important space. Um, so I was gonna, let me, oh, I know I have a quote next. I was, I was highlighting this quote, but as we think about this, grading is such a critical piece that we often get so anchored on. It's very personal for us, right? But if we understand that as much that grades reflect what students know and can do, they often communicate what teachers value and how well students can comply. That's supposed to say comply and not couply with the rules. So when, when we grade, it's like, oh, I'm gonna grade this because I think that's what matters, not necessarily allowing students to demonstrate, to demonstrate mastery. So this chart is in, the, is in this chapter, but when we think about grades, it often it combines behavior, it, be, it combines what students know, context, and if we separate them, this is comes from the work of Tom Gusky, and we think about separating them to really focus on one mastery. What can I do related to grade level expectations? So if I'm a parent, I want to know where are my students related to seventh grade expectations? Are they ahead, behind? What are the specific standards they know? What are the ones we need to work on? I also want to know how have my students grown, right? I, I share this example that as a seventh grade teacher, 
if my students were in seven, you know, at coming in at second grade level, which many of them did, I wanted to be able to convey that they also had grown so that there's, you know, they made two or three years growth. I wanted to be able to share that and highlight that. Whereas if, if I just said seventh grade standards, I would show that they were not proficient. And that doesn't show the work that they had been doing. Similarly, if my students were, were beyond seventh grade, but only grew a little bit, it didn't show maybe they didn't make a year's worth progress. So they, being able to show growth in self-assessments, in portfolios, and being able to show that journey is a critical component to one, what grade level mastery. And then the third column, what habits and skills are helpful to learn and grow? are really powerful if we do care about these skills such as collaboration, critical thinking, determination. We want to be able to help young people understand where they're showing up in these skills and not just talk about them in a poster, but actually show evidence of them. So I wanna, I'll show some examples um, of, of what I mean by this. So this is Logan County's profile of success. They're a district in Kentucky and they've defined these five skills that they, that they value. Which, which is critical. And too often, again, this can just be, um, you know, stuck on a wall. But we have examples like um, Seeks is a, is a charter school in Hawaii, and they do an incredible defense of learning where students are able to highlight these skills that they value. They are creating a portfolio. They are working on these skills in each of their classes. They're specifically targeting them, getting feedback. So by the time they're ready to leave eighth grade, they have a robust understanding of these skills. They have a portfolio that demonstrates where they are and what they can do. And then they defend their learning to their peers, to um, parents to all and also to their teachers and they're able to to really see their growth process through this but they also communicate to the entire community that it's not just I got an A in math it's that I can reason effectively I can think critically and I can demonstrate these skills in a variety of ways and so I believe really strongly that when we shift our outcomes to more broader whole child outcomes and then start to align our assessments to this, our focus changes. The kids focus, the parents focus, all of this. And today, the schools I was visiting, I saw them even in the garden, reminders to be an effective collaborator. You saw how they were communicating with students and examples um, throughout, which makes it a, a constant reminder that this is what we value and this is what we're developing. So in this next shift, of course, personalized learning is a huge component of that. So if you're doing competency-based assessment and learning, we need to allow learners to navigate their path, we need to be able to help them figure out, oh, here's what I know, here are my next steps, I'm going to be able to chart that and these are these are my goals. And I have the skills and resources to be able to meet those. So of great, this is from Cajon Valley, I believe, where students were setting goals, we know that if we set our goals, we're much more likely to meet them. So putting them up in classrooms, lots of different displays, but a fun way to think about, we all are unique individuals, we all have different strengths and talents, and setting those goals um, really can help us meet those. Um, readers Workshop, saw so much great Readers Workshop today, and students highlighted constantly, we get to pick our own books. We have skills that we're working on collectively of a as a class. We have the standards that matter, but we get to choose our books and how we apply those skills. And the assessment is based individually on what students are reading and how they're demonstrating their competence. Um, and then Readers Workshop allows you, of course, to work with small groups and, in and incorporate the writing and the reading together. Kids, you know, it's not always about furniture, but those spaces, thinking about the learning sciences, the more flexible spaces we have where young people can decide where to sit, feel comfortable, kind of just be in different spaces um, allows them to also personalize their, their path. Um, creating those rotations. This is elementary, of course, but rotations still are powerful in middle school and secondary. Um, and going back to that teacher, who many of them, I understand, are saying, we can't give feedback. I can't personalize when I have 150 kids. 
But if you're doing station rotations, you're having conferences with students, you're setting things up in ways that people can work independently, work on small groups, do projects, that of course allows that teacher time to really pull in those small groups and tailor instruction, feedback, and guidance based on what small groups or individuals need. So, and then of course, we need to be able to teach them those skills and really think about how do we develop those, um, those learning skills and I love this um, frame, and it originally comes from Education Reimagine. The idea that we typically have is learners must be compelled to learn, right? Come in, we have to make you sit down, we have to force you to do your bell ringer, we have to, you know, give you all these carrots to do your work, instead of thinking about we love to learn. Learning is powerful. And, and when we create those environments, learners want to learn. Uh, and so in some of that, this is the example I gave about my daughter, Abby, in, um, in this chapter where she was learning how to bake. And I am not a baker. I do not like to cook. <laughs> I love to eat. I love to go out, but I certainly don't love to cook. So she was not necessarily developing these skills from me, but she met with one of my neighbors who loves to bake and they brought her in and gave her exposure. And she decided she wanted to make you know, cookies and cakes because she loves sweet things. So she set goals and created a plan. She would watch YouTube videos and she would watch all these different shows, but then she actually had to get guidance and support because the first time she did it, it was a hot mess. And that happens for a lot of us. We have ideas, you know, the Pinterest fails or whatever. We try things and it doesn't work. And then it's like, I can't do it. It doesn't, you know, I'm not good enough or it won't work in my classroom or I don't have the skills. We have to say that's like step one. And based on where we are, then we need to seek that guidance and support in our classrooms that could look like mentors coming in. It could look like peers who are well beyond. It could be older kids coming in. It could be that small group rotation. There's lots of different ways that young people can get guidance and support. It could be mentors who are experts in the field, zooming in with kids or sharing a video to help them understand. Um, but that guidance and support, when we go beyond what the teacher knows, can really widen what students are able to um, understand and what they're able to do in the classroom because they're able to get support from various sources. And then, of course, we have to go through that cycle and reflect, reflect and revise our work. Um, and as I talk to kids and I ask them what they want their teachers to know, so many times they tell me, I wish we could slow down. I wish I could just tell my teacher to slow down so we have time to reflect and think about what we're learning and fix it. They often feel like they're on this hamster wheel because we do too, right? We're like just trying to get through but we have to understand if we don't make that time to reflect and revise, we are simply just going to continue to plateau. We're going to lose skills and move on. And we're not actually going to get to that place of deeply allowing students to under to feel that success, but also to understand what they're what they do know, but and also what they need to grow in. This was just today, and it's a, probably a horrible picture to see, but I, I, I wanted to put this task um, on here so you could see it. They were doing challenge-based learning, so they were in this um, STEM lab, and each group had to take on a part um, from, they were going to Mars. So this group was designing the scene, another group was designing um, or working on soil that would be um, possible in on Mars. Um, clearly, I need to do some work and investigate what Mars needs because they were teaching me a ton. They were building with robotics um, and it wasn't just fancy tools. Sometimes you get into these steam labs and it's like kids are just doing a lot of stuff with 3D printers and they're playing with Legos, but they don't actually have a purpose. Um, and in this challenge, students were actually able to articulate what the, the science skills were. They were developing the math skills, but they were also be able to communicate and work together. So an incredible project. And the teacher was just bouncing around from class or from group to group beaming you know, nudging them, asking questions, supporting them, but truly the, the young people were leading the work. So in a challenge-based system, of course, those are the things that are absolutely critical. And when we think about projects, 
a lot of times we do a project rather than engage in authentic, deep project-based learning. So a project is I went through the unit and the test, and then we made a poster board, or I made a diorama, or we got to go out and play. Um, that is doing a project that that comes after the learning. Often they're all the same. The focus is on just kind of like something pretty to put up on the wall, and it just goes to the teacher. When we think about really true, authentic project-based learning, the project is the learning. It's designed with those essential questions from the beginning. The, the path and the product is driven by the learners, just like the kids with Mars, they're, they're doing different work to get to, to develop the skills. Um, and the focus is on both the process and the product and has authentic application. So being able to combine the knowledge, skills, and dispositions in these authentic projects is what gets us that really rich powerful learning that sticks with young people forever. And this is Ron Berger's hierarchy of audience, which I love. And it's always a good reminder when I think about this pyramid, where, where am I? What am I asking people to do? Um, and often at the most typical traditional system is oh, an assignment is turned into the teacher. Maybe you extend that by saying, hey, you're going to present to your parents um, it gets even more interesting when you add the community, but we don't get to that place of highest level of motivation and engagement until we're really thinking about being of service in the world. And when we are in service of the world, that's where students say, oh, I want to do this because it matters. That's where we get learners who are compelled to learn, not who are just doing it for, um, for an assignment. Uh, this is an example, of course, of Project Ideate, where students are working with um, the community, they're designing solutions to actually meet the need of a community organization. So they're developing these skills and making a difference in their communities right now as fourth graders, not this elusive, someday you'll be able to do something that makes a difference, right? It's like right now, our young people absolutely have the knowledge and skills and ability to make an incredible difference. So I want to think about these um, questions. Ooh, here's our here's our questions for um, today. But first, I want to make some space. We have a few minutes to see what what are some questions as you're reading, just in your own context um, that you're that you're wrestling with um, that we could spend some time talking about in the next couple minutes. Feel free to put it in the chat or you can unmute if you'd like. So question I had, I had a conversation with my kids after looking at some data from like the first part of their projects that they're all working on. And we just finished like the research phase. And I have like 25 to 50% of some of the kids who haven't finished the actual research and they're not getting the work done. And so we had a conversation in class, like, is this about you know, uh, are we just unmotivated? Are we not understanding the assignment? And so I got a lot of feedback from them, but I, I do have some that I feel that are just really kind of taking advantage of it. Mm -hmm. um, and when I look at how I taught, like traditionally, there was always those same like 15, 20% kids. So, I mean, I'm still getting the same kids kind of missing the boat, but they have yeah. a lot more opportunity to help us out. Um, so any tips, tricks, or ideas of kind of getting everybody really engaged and empowered and, and working? Yeah, I love that you got feedback from your students. One, I would continue to say, what else do you need to be successful, right? Just continuing to ask that. And then sometimes we need to sit with young people and say, okay, great. You know, these, you, the three of you are struggling to get this done. Why don't you come sit next to me and I can help you. And sometimes they don't like that. Right. Um, and, and so it's, it, that's a, that's a motivator too. Um, it might be, I don't understand, or I had a bad day or, I'm just going to wait, wait you out to see if you're actually going to make me do it. And it takes a little bit longer for some kids to figure out, oh, this is the expectation. I do have to do it. You're not going to let me off the hook. Um, but I like that you made the connection, Ben, between I've always had some kids who weren't 
doing it, but now they have more and more opportunities. So that in this model, it's, I'm not going to let you fail. I'm going to sit with you. I'm going to pull you along. Um, but, but asking them, what else could I do is always a great start. Thank you. Yeah. And if anyone else has suggestions or ideas to drop them in there for Ben. Any well, other questions? Well, so it's sort of a question, um, but it's how to get teachers to think about changing their practices so that they have time to listen to students because, right, if teachers are doing all the talking all the time, then they're really not learning anything about their students and their students' needs. So. Yeah. So, um, great question. It's like I saw Kim laugh, right? Like the question of the century. How do we just flip a switch and get all their teachers to change the practice? Um, I like to say teachers create what they experience. So one, I think you have to reflect and think about um, how, you know, their professional development, their experiences as a learner to think about what have they experienced? Have they experienced coming to a room or a staff meeting and the principal telling, you know, talking to them for 45 minutes about what they need to do and giving them very little time to talk and collaborate? Um, so that's step one is kind of reflecting on how are we designing the professional learning for educators and what are those opportunities for them to do it? Um, and then also creating those experiences, making sure that there's an experience where the teachers are the learners who are engaging, grappling, struggling with their learning and, and figuring out how to, to use those strategies in their own practice. Uh, and then another one is coaching, right? So we can create these opportunities. We can read the research. We can say that this is really powerful. But if we don't get in the classrooms and coach teachers and point out, um, hey, there was 45 minutes of your talk time today. Your students had five, to, five minutes to talk. Or why don't you, you know, think about here's a strategy that you could use to shift that dynamic. Uh, I wish it was overnight, but it, it is often not. It's, it's a lot of experience, coaching, wrestling with what it means to be an effective teacher and understanding that's not just about doing all the talking. <laughs> Yet. Yeah, please do. So, I mean, I definitely like echoing everything you said, but I also think it comes down to striking agreement, right? Um, for example, some things that we've been working on here at my school, I'm in uh, Ventura County in California at a one school school district, TK through eighth grade. Uh, we have a little less than 600 kiddos. Uh, but one thing that we've been working on is with within our grade levels and grade level spans coming to agreements. And so everything we do um, as educators circles back to those agreements, which helps to keep us on track with becoming more learner-centered and, you know, down this path of personalization. Um, and then just going back to what Katie said, for example, this uh, Monday, October 31st, we have a, a full day of professional development for our teachers. Um, and so we're designing it with choice and autonomy and having them provide input um, prior to on what are some things that they want to spend time on that uh, goes back to their agreement. So I think the agreements are really important because they um, what grounds the work as you move forward. Thanks, Kim. And, you know, to add on to that, like you said, you the agreements providing time for teachers to talk about the agreements, be accountable to one another, not just the principal, um, and then the coaching that they get um, in the classrooms too, to support those shifts. Janelle, did you come off mute? It looked like you wanted to say something. <laughs> oh, that is just what I, I'm always seeing the, the why of this and the why. And I think another thing, even watching my new teachers come out of the universities, um, it's far from what is happening. So I just think too, is also getting our teachers on learning walks themselves yes. to also to network where this is happening and for them to see it, because I think it is such a 
kind of a fearful thing. Like everybody's just, it's chaos and everybody's just doing their own thing. And this is what their mindset lens says. And when you actually see it, it's, it's so, when you hear those learners talking about their learning and how those teachers have so much joy and humanness, I think that is one of the biggest things too, is to have them, have them see it. Yeah. Thanks, Janelle. I love it. So I started this year asking my class if they want to play school or engage in authentic learning. Ben, say more about that. I love it. What'd they say? Okay. So I came in like four weeks after the school year started. So I was already in a tough position. Um, and I couldn't, I, I just, I can't do the can curriculum and all that, that crap anymore. Um, so I asked my kids, I said, you know, here, here's what it looks like to play school. And I give you an assignment and I decide what we learn and you do the assignment or you don't do the assignment. And then you pretend to learn something or you pretend to be busy. And then I grade the assignment, but you don't really get any feedback. And then we move on to the next assignment. And that's how our school year goes. Uh, and then we take the standardized test and none of us really pass except for the ones who are gonna pass when they walked in on the first day. I said, or we can engage in authentic learning where it starts with you guys and what are you curious about? And then you take your curiosity, your passion, a challenge or a problem that you have with life and you research that. And then you come up with an idea of maybe how to fix that and learn about it. And then you try it and your first draft is always gonna suck. And so we just accept that right from the beginning and we put it out there. And then you build towards expertise because you keep practicing and practicing. And some of your projects are gonna take all year and some of them are gonna take two months and, and we just roll with it. But as long as we're working and we're learning and everybody's going at their own pace, then that's how we'll measure success. And so they all just looked at me like I had two heads and, and then he said, well, how, how are you gonna get away from doing the curriculum? All teachers are required to teach springboard. And I said, well, you let me worry about that. And if they wanna fire me, there's a teacher shortage. So go for it. And, um, and we did it and then like it kind of caught on and now I've got all these kids doing like, I have 150 kids who I give individual feedback to all the time. And they're doing these amazing, really cool projects. I mean, I, I still have my kids who are lost, but we're getting them found and getting them caught up. And, and I have time and space now to actually give them the individual attention they need. So I mean, we've really gone for it. And then, like I told them, I said, you know, I've taught as a traditional teacher for the last 20 years and it, and it just kind of sucks and it's soul sucking and it's no fun anymore. And so I said, this is, this is my project for the year is to do this and to teach this way. I said, but I'm sorry for you guys. You're my first year. It's going to suck. I'm going to suck at it. I'm going to make a lot of mistakes. It's going to be messy. So give me a bunch of feedback and help me get better. I love that, Ben. What a model for so many of us to just dive in and learn. Um, and I love that you talk to your students about it. And like you said, this is your project, very authentic learning. We're all constantly learning and evolving. 